So what I want to talk to you about today is, yeah, you can go and you can read your articles about responsive web design. They're everywhere. That's, that's without question. Um, and you can go and you can look at the examples. And, and there are good examples and there are medium examples and there are some really awful examples out there. And then there's the backlash. Um, we're starting to see articles now about people who are like, oh, no, 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 you need a complete mobile experience. This responsive web design thing, it just doesn't do what it's supposed to do. You can't just rely on CSS and media queries and fluid grids and fluid images to get where you want to go. It, it, it's not working. Well, it's not working because they're not doing it right. What do you need to do to do it right? Now, work with me here. I've been a consultant for a really long time, and sometimes I've been the in-house consultant, sometimes I've been the actual consultant. So this is how I tend to think in terms of questions and eliciting requirements, and uh, what does it take to really make it go? And, and so it has to be down a couple of levels below that surface. Hey, everybody's saying RWD, case in point. I heard fairly recently, or actually somebody sent me a sample fairly recently, and he said, this is supposed to be responsive web design. You might want to consider using it in some way as an example of responsive web design. I looked at it on my iPhone. It was a full-size desktop web page on my iPhone. And so I questioned the person who sent it to me, and I said, who told you this was responsive web design? And the answer I got was, well, well so-and-so told me it was responsive web design, and they know what they're talking about. And so, of course, I did what, you know, uh, us people who like to prove things wrong do. We take screenshots. <laughs> I sent that back. And they said, uh, this is not responsive web design. And the response was, yeah, you're right. That's not responsive web design. It turned out that this person was out for dinner. Her boss was present. The concept and topic of responsive web design came up. And in a effort to impress her boss, when asked, so where are you guys with responsive web? Oh, we do responsive web design. We, we, yeah, our, our site is totally about responsive web design. Oops. So, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't do responsive web design. I'm just saying that this is a really cool technology, and when it works, it works really well, and it's about the users, and the users have a really good experience. When it doesn't work, it's a horrible user experience. Um, and that explains a lot of the backlash. So, consider the following. Do you have a content strategy that matches up with your business plan? Content strategy is about how you're going to get your content out in front of people, and that includes everything under the sun, the user experience, the content itself. Is the content right for any one given user experience? Is the content even appropriate for that vehicle? There are a lot of different ways to do content strategies. You can decide you're going to do an XML first content strategy. You can decide you're going to do an HTML5 based content strategy. But the point is, is that you got to get in there. You got to figure out what content you have, what your content is, what it's going to be. And you need to document this and you need to have this strategy in the minds of the people who are on your team so that people have an idea of the goal that everybody's going for. The second part is, it's content people, it's all about the reading experience. If you take people out of the reading experience, here's a really good one, iBooks. iBooks drives me nuts because every time there's a URL in iBooks, I'm one of those people who over highlights everything completely. Has anybody seen uh, uh, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo movie? And when he first starts going into the research, the American one, the first starts going into the research and he highlights every line on the page on the research, my husband leaned over to me and he said, he highlights like you do. Um, so 
this reading experience is really important because if you so much as accidentally go near a URL in iBooks, you are immediately popped out of iBooks and into the Safari. My immersive reading experience, my train of thought, and everything else is destroyed. And we wonder why all these adults are now showing up with ADHD, myself included. So remember that it's content, it's reading, it's typography. Typography rules the reading experience. And as somebody who got their start actually laying out pages with a pen and a pack of stick and a calculator and some galleys, um, I can tell you that typography rules the scholarly reading experience more than any other reading experience. You can get away with a couple of typos in a trade book. You can even get away with some <laughs> mistakes in an education you know, educational content, whether it's K through 12 or higher ed. You do that in a scholarly journal, somebody's gonna nail you. <laughs> they're, gonna, they're gonna look at the math, they're gonna look at the exhibits, and if it's not perfect, there's going to be a letter to the editor. There's going to be a comment to, I mean, these are, you know, I grew up in a university town, so I know how this works, you know. Everybody has to be the professor. You know, that's how it works. Somebody is going to point it out because that's what they do. All right, so let's move on. So the deal here is, yes, you get media queries, you get fluid grids, which is really a, a very old uh, concept in typography, is this grid system. Uh, and you get these responsive images, which is a whole other can of worms, but we're, we're just gonna do the basics today. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And that's where your content strategy comes in, among other things. All right. In case you didn't know where you were, you're here. There's this overall overarching concept in web design world called adaptive design. And there's things like progressive enhancement, where you start from the lowest common denominator, and as you add features to a device, you support those features. But you can always at least have some experience on that little handheld phone that, you know, that guy won't give up because you're going to have to pull, pull it out of his cold, dead hand. Um, I'm married to that guy. He went through two old Blackberries, including mine, before I could get an Android phone in his hand. He's had it for four years. He still hasn't set up email. <laughs> yeah, and he's technical, too. So we are at this point over on the right for us um, with responsive design. Actually, my left. Yeah, my left, sorry. I'm left-handed, so I have this dyslexia thing. Um, so over on the left, you have the responsive design and you have what makes up responsive layout. And then you have these things called hybrid layouts. And you know what? It's not black and white. There's no rule saying that you can't intermingle your responsive web design with your adaptive layouts and that you can actually, oh, God forbid, combine a little bit of JavaScript into the functionality that you're doing with your responsive web design components. It's a matter of business requirements and your content strategy. If it's right for your content and it's right for what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish, you make use of the tools you have available to you. So anybody who tries to tell you it's all black and white, no, it's never black and white. I'm a consultant, I know these things. And it never sits still either. That's the other thing. This responsive web design stuff, or any of the stuff you're hearing about here, you know, think about it as a river with a really strong current. You can try to fight the current and stand still and do nothing and wait for it to calm down or stop, but that's kind of the point. River currents don't stop. We are not at a point where it's not like you're going to learn the big new thing and that's going to be it for the next 10 years. It's not going to stop changing at this point. You're going to have to keep changing with it. You're going to have to make that effort to keep yourself moving with how this stuff is moving because it's not going to stop. There won't be any one 
specific way that, you know, this is the journal you know, best practices now. No, it's a constantly moving target. And if you expect that it's going to be anything else, um, good luck with that current. So here's a couple of, uh, here's, here's my real consulting things. Responsive design rules to live by. Just because you can does not mean you should. There is a time and a place for everything, and there is some content, especially in journals, that just isn't going to work out on a five-inch screen, even if it is a Galaxy Note, even if it has a retina. And I'll show you an example of that later. The other thing is, and this goes back to your content strategy and the overall business strategy, the sooner you start, the longer it takes. Really. If you don't plan in advance what you're going to do, what your business purpose is, and make sure that everybody on your team is on board with that and has an understanding, you're all using the same vocabulary. If you dive into a technology, you know, oh, it's just a pilot. Well, you know what happens with pilots. They end up being production without people throwing out the pilot and then redoing for production. The sooner you start, the longer it takes. So, what do you do? How do you do this? Planning your approach. Content strategy for responsive web design. First of all, why are you considering responsive design? Is it because everybody's saying, responsive design, responsive web design? Is it because it's a buzzword? Is it because you read an article? Why? What is it going to bring to your user experience? Is it going to make things easier to read? Is it going to make things more ubiquitous for your users? The second thing, and, and Ethan Marcotte is told me about this one, um, context is king. But at the same time, make no assumptions about what your user's context will be. Case in point, mobile versus laptop. I, I have some stats here. The first thing to know is that the majority of people who are using iPads for surfing the web are not on the go. They're not in a subway. They're not trying to look up a gas station or look for tickets or something like that. They're sitting in front of their TV. Unless they're an oncologist, I found out earlier in the mobile session today, at which point they're carrying their full-size iPad around in their lab coats at the hospital because it's easier for old people to read. <laughs> now, I happen to be blind as a bat, so I prefer to read on my full-size iPad, too. But I'm going to give you some stats. But first, I have to pull up those stats. These are stats from today. Now, you know, imagine the Twitter and news and everything following. This tweet just came 15 minutes ago. In a study from Pearson Learning, almost one-third of students in the grades 4 to 12 already own a tablet, and over 40% own a smartphone. <laughs> so that's grades 4 through 12. Those are our teenagers. This is the digital native guys. Now, this is an article from DBW Bookwire this morning. Over half of Americans now own a smartphone, and this is uh, from research from the Pew Internet and Life, our American Life Project. They've been tracking smartphone ownership since 2011. Hey, I've had one way longer than that. Today, about 56% own smartphones. That's up from 46% a year ago. Uh, they have some other stats here, but the point is, is that this mobile stuff, it's not going away. And the fact that um, there are so many different smartphones on the market, in different sizes, flavors, varieties. Everybody has their own personal opinion. Everybody wants their own user experience. And oh, by the way, everybody wants to control their own user experience as well. So context is king. But you can't make assumptions. Even though these people are surfing on their phones, they're surfing on their iPads or their tablets, they are not necessarily doing the things that people thought people would do with mobile devices back in the pixel perfect days. And the people who are actually using desktops to surf are usually at the office 
or the researchers, or, I mean, it's a different animal altogether. Why are people on your site? Why are people there in the first place? What do they want to do? What do they want to find? Abstracts, anyone? What do they want to read? Abstracts or journal articles? You tell me. Another tenant, and this is, um, there's another guy, Luke Warbrecksky, I'm probably murdering his last name, but hey, turnabout's fair play. Um, he wrote a book called uh, Mobile First, and it's uh, part of the same series as Ethan e. Marcotte's uh, book, um, which is Responsive Web Design. Um, it's all on a website called A Book Apart, which is something that was begot by a website called A List Apart, which is where they published the original Ethan Marcotte Responsive Web Design article, as well as the Bruce Lawson ar article that was mentioned earlier. Um, I sent out tweets to the SSP uh, hashtag earlier with URLs for both of those. Um, so this idea of mobile first, it used to be it's always easier to take away than it is to add. Well, at this point, given the stats that I just gave you and given the stats that you heard earlier, maybe it's time for us to start thinking about the mobile experience first and then build out or down or sideways from there based on the needs of the people who are coming to sites and reading content. Whoops, that wasn't what I meant to do. Think fluid, think proportions, think relative percentages, think in M's. Do not think in pixels, please. I know you have to do math to get percentages and there is no bigger math phobe in this world than me. You should see me trying to figure out a tip for dinner and I travel a lot, it's kind of scary, it takes a lot of time. Uh, but this is what makes fluid grids work. This is what makes the fluid content in your responsive web design. Uh, if you put pixels in there, you fixed it. You've fixed a value. And you don't want to do that in responsive web design. And another thing is, uh, this is kind of a good web hygiene thing and a good best practices for the web thing. When you're doing responsive web design, it's usually not a good idea to try to fall back on hacks like browser sniffing or hiding content or disabling function like Zoom. Um, readers really hate it when you disable functionality, first of all. Uh, that does not make for a good reader experience. Readers also um, don't like it very much when content is missing. And believe me, um, somebody who is going from a tablet to a website to a phone and reading the same thing on all three things, if they get different content across the three different devices from one article, they're not going to be happy. And the last thing is don't forget about performance because there's a lot of things that you can do with CSS and fluid grids and responsive images, but the most important part of the reader experience beyond the fact that all of this stuff, this typography and everything should just fall away and you should just be immersed in what they're reading, is that if the content just doesn't appear on the screen and you get the spinning beach ball or the spinning circle these days, um, or the spinning, has anybody seen the dot, 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 yeah, that. Um, that's not a very good user experience either. So here's a reference here. Um, I apologize for the logo over there. Um, when they post these sites, uh, the, it, aspect ratio, this is unfortunately not responsive. Um, but here is uh, a link to an article where I pulled these seven tips from. It was a, uh, a pertinent article while I was actually creating these slides yesterday. So I decided, yeah, we'll go with that. Because it pretty much said what I wanted to say. Okay, so there's this site called Readmill. And Readmill is a social reading site where you can upload your books. And then there's a, you know, apps and you read your apps. And you can comment on things and make notes. And you can have public things. And people can review each other's notes. And they can follow each other. The most popular book on this site right now is Ethan Marcotte's Responsive Web Design. 
Uh, and so everybody's up there making their notes and highlighting and you know, making more notes. And so Ethan actually got out into the site. And he started looking at the various comments. And he actually, um, and this is a blog post that you guys can go look at, he wanted to make sure that it's, it's not about making things fit. Yeah, fluid is part of it. And responsive images are part of it. And media queries are part of it. But it's not about making it fit. It's about the context. It's about the reading experience. So you got to make it appropriate for all your users, regardless of the screen, regardless of that screen size, you're not going to know. So don't try to anticipate it. It's just not going to happen. Somebody's going to pick up some weird thing, you know, no name tablet from somewhere that's got some weird aspect ratio, and they're going to try to read it. And then they're going to yell bloody murder if they can't. So here's an example from a journal. I did this on purpose. This is actually a, let's see if that can work. There we go. This is a, a landscape screenshot from an iPhone 5. Uh, what's wrong with this picture? Well, my graphic, my exhibit, fits the width just fine, and if I turn it to the portrait, it'll fit just fine as well. But if I actually try to look at it vertically, I don't have the entire graphic there. This is another thing. Can anybody read that, that um, either equation one or equation two here? No. But this is how you usually do type of, you know, a typographic treatment for equations in journal articles. You can't read this on an iPhone, not in a portrait iPhone anyway. You got to think about this stuff. Remember, they're going to nail you. They're, they're professors. That, that's what they do. So here's another screenshot. In the landscape view, my equation one and equation two are far more readable than they were in the portrait. Is this appropriate content for a smartphone? Do we need to start thinking about different ways to do typographic treatment for equations to make this stuff available on any screen, any time, anywhere, any place? These are all things that you need to consider, especially when you're publishing journal content. So the end result is that the typography, that matters. The context, that matters. And the content strategy, that's what drives it. So here's a couple of more examples. In this particular example, this is iPhone 5 again. You can see that it's an article opener, and it looks great. You know, it's, it's, it's suitable. Now the font's probably a little too small. But here's the same article on an iPhone 5 on the landscape. Well, I've lost a lot of real estate. It's a bit wider now, but um, yeah, uh, it's going to be doing a lot of scrolling on that one. Here's, OK, I'm, I'm living. I'm almost done. This is the uh, same article over on the Galaxy Note 8. And it's actually, a, it's a good reading width. I've got a lot of content there. It works out pretty well for me. Um, I, I would be a happy reader with this environment. However, this is the same article over on the iPad in portrait. Now my reading column's too wide. Guess what? There's stuff you can do in responsive web design a little bit of JavaScript to say that I want my reading column not to exceed maybe 75 words. And if it does, take some stuff from the bottom and move it up over onto the right so I don't have a big chunk of white space over there. Last example is from my MacBook. And I didn't, this, I actually like narrowed it. I didn't do a full window display because that, that reading column was like from this end of the room to that end of the room. And it was really, whoa, whoa. But the point is that these things all matter. It's part of the reading experience. And it's not just enough to do this responsive fluid grid thing that can resize for any device. You've got to think about the other stuff. 
So, this is me, pretty obvious. Uh, you know where to find me. I'm on Twitter all the time. Um, at, obviously, really easy to find me on Twitter as well. I work for Aptara. Um, what I've been telling people is if you've got content, we can help you do something with it. And uh, thanks for taking the time to listen to me today. <laughs>